Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLinks, Feed the Future, and the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Today, Feed the Future's Business Drivers for Food Safety Project, a USAID-funded activity implemented by Food Enterprise Solutions, will discuss their cool and clean approach in Senegal and next steps in working with businesses to create a culture of food safety in Senegal and beyond. My name is Julie McCarty and I'm your AgriLinks webinar host today. I'm a knowledge management and learning specialist with the Center for Nutrition within the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, also known as RFS. Before we dive into the content, I just wanted to go over a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat feature on the right-hand side to introduce yourselves and share resources. Please let us know your name, where you're joining from, what organization you're with, and or what interested you in the topic of this webinar today. We really like for our webinars to be as interactive and engaging as possible, so uh, we, we'd love to know just where you're joining from so we can see kind of where our audience is coming from around the world. However, what's different from previous AgriLinks webinars, um, if you've attended them in the past, is that we ask that you use the Q&A feature on the right-hand side to ask your questions for the presenters. In some cases, the presenters will respond to your questions directly within that chat feature. There's a way for them to, to provide text answers for some clarifying questions. And we'll also hold some of the questions until the end of the presentations, when we'll have about 30 minutes res reserved for verbal Q&A. So please do click on that little Q&A box on the right-hand side for your questions. And a couple of other key features of this BlueJeans platform that we're on at the bottom of your screen, uh, if you kind of hover down there, you'll see that there's a slider button where you can toggle the size of the uh, video of the person who's speaking versus the size of the presentation to make those bigger or smaller, which I think is a pretty cool feature. And there also should be a closed caption button. Um, I believe it's, let's see. I'm not entirely sure where it is when I look at my screen, but I think it's on the bottom left-hand side. Um, but we'll verify that and, and post about it in the chat box if anyone is in need of the closed captioning. Lastly, we are recording this webinar, and we will email you the recording, the transcript, and any additional resources once they're ready. And they'll also be posted on the AgriLinks event page for this webinar. All right, so before we dive into the meat of today's webinar, I would like to highlight a few points about food safety and its importance to USAID programming. As the world faces increased threats from climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic, food safety remains a development priority that plays a really vital role in improving nutrition and building more productive and inclusive communities. Food safety is really fundamental. It underpins progress toward the global food security strategy, USAID's multi-sectoral nutrition strategy, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Each year, about 600 million people become ill from contaminated food, leading to about 420,000 deaths and 110 billion in additional costs for developing countries. This is a huge problem that needs urgent attention. Food safety interventions can reduce this burden from foodborne diseases, and they can also increase the affordability and accessibility of safe and nutritious diets, and even reduce food loss and waste. So at USAID, we recognize the importance of a food systems approach that addresses food safety at multiple points along the pathway from producers to consumers and through a variety of food system actors. Temperature control and hygiene techniques are two really important food safety practices along that pathway. So we're really excited to have business drivers for food safety discuss those technologies today. Next slide, please. I wanted to highlight that this June on AgriLinks, our theme month is food safety, and we hope you will follow along to learn about the issues uh, I just described and consider submitting blog posts or resources that address food safety. You can submit directly on the website if you have an account, or you can always email agrilinks at agrilinks.org for help. And as you may be aware, this past Monday was the third annual World Food Safety Day. Um, and, and USAID was really excited to participate in commemorating this day 
in recognition of the community's important work on food safety related research and technical assistance. I would like to highlight one important resource that was released on Monday, and that is USAID's new food safety technical brief, which is uh, pictured on the right hand side of your screen. And it's entire to, or intended to inspire and guide the integration of food safety interventions within agriculture, nutrition, resilience, and WASH programming. This brief outlines steps that USAID missions can take to adopt a risk-based approach when incorporating food safety into their strategic programming. It cites a few case studies of food safety challenges and how the US government works with local organizations, development partners, and local governments to address those issues. While the brief is targeted at USAID missions, we hope that the full AgriLinks community will read it and engage in further discussions about how to address food safety throughout the food system. So we'll drop the link into the chat box and we'll also be sure that this brief is shared in the post event email. All right, I am going to go ahead and introduce our speakers so that we can learn more about the cool and clean approach. First up for our speakers today will be Thorik Sederstrom, who is the Director of Research and Learning at Food Enterprise Solutions with the Business Drivers for Food Safety Activity. Thorik is a champion of market-driven approaches to reducing hunger and malnutrition, and he is a recognized research analyst and program strategist. His expertise includes developing cash-based interventions for rural livelihoods, conducting participatory food security assessments, designing stakeholder training, and conducting anthropometric surveys. And from his roots growing up on a dairy farm in Missouri, uh, he's gone on to work extensively in Latin America, Africa, Central Asia, and South Asia. And he holds degrees in development anthropology, medical anthropology, agricultural economics, and archaeology. After Thorpe will be Mariama Deng, who is the Business Drivers for Food Safety's uh, Sen Senegal Program Director with Food Enterprise Solutions. Mariama is an expert in business and development with 15 years of experience managing gender sensitive development programs covering several West African countries. She has overseen regional agriculture and fisheries, micro and small enterprise programs that aim to raise revenues and better market access through quality improvements. She holds a master's in development studies and a certificate of continuing education in entrepreneurship and promotion of small and medium enterprises from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva and a bachelor's in business and international trade. And then finally, we will welcome Tawanda Muzingi, an adjunct professor in the development or in sorry, in the Department of Food Bioprocessing and Nutrition Sciences at North Carolina State University and an innovation consultant with RTI. Tawanda is supporting the Business Drivers Project as a short term food safety consultant. He is a nutritionist, food scientist and development expert who has previously worked with multiple centers in the CGIAR system, and he has obtained his PhD in biochemical and molecular nutrition and MS in food policy and applied nutrition from the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University and his bachelor in nutrition. So our three speakers will present for about 15 minutes each, and then we will open the floor to respond verbally to as many audience questions as we can. So thank you all for bearing with me, and I'd love to pass the microphone over to Thorik. Thank you very much, uh, Julie, for those uh, introductions and uh, setting the framework uh, of the issues that are quite pressing now in, in the, at the global level around food safety and its relationship to food security. On behalf of Food Enterprise Solutions, I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar. We appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedules to turn, tune in. We look forward to a vigorous question and answer period at the end of the presentation. So uh, let's start. I'd like to uh, set the stage for uh, our approach uh, about business drivers for food safety, as we call it uh, BD for FS, we use that acronym. It's a five-year initiative funded by the Bureau of Resilience and Food Security at USAID. 
And we're focused on building the capacity of growing food businesses to support their adoption of improved food safety practices and technologies with the goal of re uh, reducing the risk of food contamination and mitigating food loss at a business level. Our focus countries for this uh, initiative are Senegal, Nepal, and Ethiopia, and we're hoping that Rwanda will come online soon. We're currently in discussions with the mission there about uh, possibilities of implementing BD for FS. Five-year project, uh, we started 1st of June in 2019, and it runs through uh, the 30th of May of 2024. Next slide, please. So you'll hear us use the term growing food business throughout the three presentations. And just a quick uh, operational definition of the term, uh, and my colleagues will expand upon this, but just so you know from the beginning, we use the term growing food business or the acronym GFB, refer referring to small to medium-sized local food businesses that are influential actors in the national food system. Also, they have a strong entrepreneurial spirit with a desire to grow and who already embrace food safety as an integral part of their business strategy. So our focus is to strengthen the capacity of these key actors and to assist them to become positive agents of change uh, within their uh, food system with the goal of reducing uh, food the risk of food contamination mitigating uh, pre-consumer food loss, and strengthening the overall food system. Next slide, please. What we have found in our research in food safety, it's a well-established science with uh, a lot of uh, excellent studies uh, that exist, is that there are two key axes of, of activities that food businesses can employ to address food safety in perishable food products. Uh, and these are temperature control and food hygiene. And these are vital for keeping perishable foods safe as they move off the farm through the food system and flow into the consumer's, uh, into the consumer's hand. Any sort of disruption of the cold chain uh, from farm to fork and any breakdown in hygienic practices during food handling at any point of the supply chain, whether it's production, processing, transporting, storage, and final retail can lead to spoilage and contamination. And if this happens, it will adversely affect the safety and the nutritional value of the food as well as uh, impacting negatively the shelf life, the quality, especially in nutritional quality. And for the business, it will negatively impact the profitability of their business. Next slide, please. So our cool and clean approach, we branded it this way uh, to uh, encapsulate these two key axes of temperature control and food hygiene. And uh, this approach is uh, a set of activities along these two activities uh, axes that will assist growing food businesses to uh, uh, improve their food safety practices. Our focus is on nutrient-dense perishable foods uh, because these uh, can, are, are most beneficial for the vulnerable populations that we're concerned about. And these include uh, horticultural produce, meats, poultry, fish, dairy, and eggs. We take uh, what we call a, a, a 5D approach. It's a five-step collaborative, integrated, and iterative approach in which we work with local food businesses, uh, food safety experts, USAID missions, and other implementing partners to co-discover uh, what are the barriers as well as the enablers and also co-design solutions with the businesses that make sense for them and to assist them to adopt safer food practices and technology. These five steps include discovery, design, deployment, 
documentation and dissemination. And I might uh, point out that documentation occurs throughout, it, it appears here sequentially, but it really starts from the discovery process and goes all the way through the life of the project. With this collaborative approach, uh, we feel that improved practices and technologies can be tailored to the local needs of the businesses that are participating with us. Might also point out that cooling technologies uh, do not have to be high tech or energy intensive. Uh, they can be uh, very appropriate and very affordable, for example, shade cooling. And also I want to point out that cleanliness is much broader than just uh, hygiene, addressing bacteriological contamination, but it also includes physical and chemical contamination. Next slide, please. So applying the uh, BD for FS cool and clean approach in Senegal, uh, we just have completed stage one in the D5 process, which is discovery. Some of the activities that we in, uh, undertook in this uh, first initial stage was uh, we held uh, first and foremost co-creation meetings with the USAID mission to understand their priorities and their concerns and to prepare to undertake a food safety uh, situational analysis. We also set up a team of on the ground experts, which is currently headed up by our esteemed colleague, Mariama. Uh, and these colleagues have expertise and experience in project oversight, communications, business engagement, and of course, food safety specialists. We completed a food safety situation analysis uh, to identify key food corridors, food safety challenges, as well as business constraints and opportunities. After we did the uh, food safety situation analysis and based on the findings there and the questions raised in that, we also undertook uh, subsequent follow-on studies to drill down deeper in some key issues that, and, uh, that we discovered and to better understand the challenges as well as to identify potential growing food businesses that would want to partner with us. Next slide, please. So, as part of the discovery process, the food safety situation analysis was conducted. We did this between March and July of 2020. Uh, unfortunately, to hit right at the, we implemented it right at the time that COVID-19 hit really hard, and so we had to uh, use some creative means of of reaching the constituents that we were interested in and speaking with and getting their perspectives on the food safety situation in in Senegal, but uh, we persevered and uh, our consultants as well as our Senegal uh, colleagues did a really good job and produced a very good study. Uh, some of the key findings from that study are that like in many Feed the Future countries where AID is working, food systems lack adequate temperature control from, uh, from on the farm all the way to consumers. Uh, uh, mixed, if we can say, and sometimes quite deficient, uh, leading to food contamination. Some of the key factors impacting food safety in Senegal include uh, cleanliness, and this includes toxic contamination that I'll speak to uh, in the next slide, uh, challenges around cold chain logistics, and then access to affordable financing by um, growing food businesses. Next slide, please. So following the financing uh, included the following. We did a very interesting uh, study that sought to characterize uh, fresh food markets in Senegal uh, and what were the conditions of uh, cleanliness and cooling technology in the fresh food markets. We did this through a directed observation exercise using a downloaded app uh, and it, it gave us some very interesting insights uh, and very quickly allowed us to uh, cover 
all the major uh, fresh food markets in Senegal. Also in the, uh, in the FSSA, we identified that WASH, water sanitation and hygiene conditions at seafood processing sites were quite, uh, quite deficient. And so we wanted to understand the dynamics around WASH for business much better. So we commissioned a specific study to look at this. Uh, also, during the FSSA, we identified that traditional smoke process, uh, smoke, smoking fish uh, also generates something called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. This is a toxic contaminant, quite carcinogenic. And uh, we uh, did a, a focused ethnographic study uh, among the women fish processors to understand the, uh, the dynamics of this. Uh, smoking process, as well as the challenges from previous attempts to promote uh, alternative uh, technologies among this group of women fish processors. We also did a, a very detailed financial landscape assessment, and this was done to understand uh, better the barriers that growing food businesses face in accessing uh, affordable financing to upscale their technologies and uh, also to identify what are existing funding sources that growing food businesses could potentially access in Senegal. We also, give, uh, related to the PAH a study that we did among processors, we also uh, conducted a study uh, of uh, consumer awareness around uh, PAH in smoked fish products, as well as uh, assessing their willingness to pay for a safer food product. And this would allow us to perhaps work with women's uh, processing groups to uh, be more motivated to adopt safer smoking uh, technologies in order to access a higher end. And then finally, using the same app-based uh, technology, we did an evaluation of, overall evaluation of consumer protect, uh, perceptions of food safety and home-based uh, food storage. Next slide, please. So in this discovery phase, uh, we identified that some of the uh, key constraints to growing food businesses to adopt safer food practices. One of the first uh, and foremost in, uh, in Senegal is that there is a strong food safety capacity that already exists. Uh, however, it's currently concentrated in the export sector, which is driven by, by a profit motive and markets, international markets such as the EU that have very stringent uh, food safety regulations. And the business community uh, in the export sector in Senegal has responded very vigorously and very proactively and is very much in sync with these international regulations. However, we also found that there's a minimal spillover effect of this existing uh, food safety capacity in Senegal to the national food system. And in fact, we found through our various assessments that there are significant food safety challenges around knowledge, awareness, and practice, including a lack of the following access to clean water, electricity, sanitary work conditions, hygienic and safe practices for food handling and processing, adequate cooling practices and technologies, and this is throughout the food system, and access to affordable financing for uh, growing food businesses to adopt the right sorts of technologies and practices that would be in alignment with safer food. Uh, we also have uh, mapped out that there is a wide range of growing food businesses, uh, as can be imagined within the, the food system of Senegal. And uh, the challenges they face depend on the type of business that they are, the food that they work with, where they are within the food system and their size, their scale, and the, the scope of their business. Next slide, please. So in summary, uh, BD for FS, we focus on perishable nutrient-dense foods because uh, of their nutritional value to the vulnerable populations that we're concerned about. 
And cool and clean practices and technologies can improve the food safety of these perishable foods. Through our co-design and co-creation process with the different stakeholders, such as USAID, growing food businesses, other uh, partners, we are endeavoring to collectively, jointly uh, discover relevant and applicable solutions to the food safety challenges that exist in Senegal. Very participatory approach that engages everyone's expertise and experience. All the findings from these different studies that I cited are uh, summarized in our technical learning note series. So most of them have already been published or will soon be published. And these can be found on our BDF, uh, BD for FS AgriLinks page. Currently, we're uh, initiating uh, phase two, or phase two in the 5D process, which is co-design. And we are exploring with growing food businesses in, in Senegal, how can we adapt and disseminate uh, the existing food safety capacity in Senegal, which is currently targeting export markets, but how can we uh, retool that, adapt that, disseminate that uh, with, uh, within food businesses that are focused on local and regional markets. And my colleague Mariama will speak to that. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions and uh, questions about this uh, particular things. And I will hand it over to my colleague Mariama. Thank you. My name is Mariama and I'm FAS for the Future Senegal BD4 FS Program Director and I'm most happy uh, to share with you our cool and clean business school design strategy on the ground. Next please. Uh, Turk has uh, defined the word GFB and you may want to pay attention to this because all the cool and clean approach is about co-designing food safety solutions with GFBs and making them agents of positive change. Therefore, you need to remember that uh, GFBs are small and medium-sized businesses. They are in the agri-food business most dealing with perishable products such as fruits, vegetables, meat, poultry, seafood, etc. And last but not least, they are willing to integrate food safety in their daily business operation. Next, please. Another important definition is about what we call lead or ambassador firms. They are large firms who have a food safety policy and are interested to partner with the business drivers for food safety program in order to support GFBs that are part of their supply chain. This being said, let me dive into our cool and clean co-design cool approach now. Next, please. The Senegal uh, BD4FS uh, invites uh, GFBs and ambassador firm here to engage in a culture of food safety and participate fully in the co-design of food safety solutions during this challenging COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Next, please. To do so, we went through different stages that are identification, selection, co-creation, and implementation. Next, please. Most of our GFBs and lead firms were identified in the discovery phase that Torek mentioned and the important studies laid out. Also, the uh, bd for fs Senegal team is well introduced to the Senegalese business landscape, and we could identify many potential GFBs through our diverse networks, leading us 
to have a spreadsheet up to a hundred of grown food businesses and big firms. Next, please. Then comes the selection process as follows. We release a request for expressions of interest in our national newspaper, Le Soleil, and almost all GFBs that were uh, identified responded. And the Senegal team has worked with the home base office team to set up some selection criteria, um, leading us to a list of 50 potential GFBs participants. Some due diligence have been sent, and uh, since the program aims to encourage a culture of food safety, we want to sign MOUs with most committed GFBs that will be uh, our food safety champions. Next, please. Then comes the co-creation process to uh, a co-creation dialogues, seminars, surveys, workshops, aiming to one, identify, next please, identify barriers and enablers to adopting improved food safety practices and also to co-create effective solutions ensuring the supply of safe and nutritious food to the domestic market. And after this, uh, those co-creation, please go back to the... And after these co-creation dialogues, uh, and once some co-creation was achieved, we started the implementation phase. So GFBs implement a grid open food safety solutions and the BD4FS program provides trainings geared to their needs and facilitates technical business financial partnership among other services. Next, please. It's important to uh, uh, recall here that monitoring, evaluation, and learning is an integrated component to our co-design approach. So we have identified food safety indicators and metrics that are relevant and of interest to GFBs. We share those self-monitoring tools with them. The ME team uh, will be collecting data and monitoring progress. We will also be documenting our learning agenda and of course, will be adjusting as we proceed. Next, please. And like uh, MEL, communication also is a cross-cutting activity. Through our cool and clean awareness campaign, the BD4FS team is raising food safety awareness among businesses and consumers in Senegal. Some comes Activities include cross-sector workshops with GFBs, regulatory agencies, financial institutions, and other relevant organizations on food safety topics. Another important uh, comes activity on the ground is our food safety mobile messaging that we call MC Food. And since uh, youth is a uh, about 50% of Senegalese population, we have organized a mobile app competition among you for the development of a food safety learning app. Next, please. Uh, before we wrap up this presentation, I would like to share with you two illust illustrative case studies of what we call uh, GFB or lead ambassador. So Tutu Tutti is one of our GFB's participants and Oshan is one of our ambassador firm in Senegal. 
Tutti Tutti, um, the business track for food safety program build Tutti Tutti's capacity to supply safe and nutritious foods. And by partnering with Ocean, we aim to improve food safety of products produced by DFB supplying Ocean. Uh, last slide, please. I, I'll just stop there and I'll be happy to discuss this approach more during the Q&A session. Thank you. Back to Tawanda. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tawanda Mujingi. I'm going to be commenting mostly on the two speakers um, that have done a great job, uh, Torik and Mariam, and putting uh, the work that FES is doing into perspective. Um, so my talk will be titled Achieving Food Security in Senegal by Addressing Food Safety Concerns among uh, growing food businesses. Next slide, please. So why are we interested in food safety in Senegal? Um, I think when you define food security, you know that there is a strong emphasis on safe. So if the food is not safe, it's not food at all, and we can never address or achieve food security uh, for all the people. And uh, food security and food safety are, are interlinked. Um, and when you have unsafe food, you create a vicious cycle of, of malnutrition and disease. And this affects particularly children, uh, young infants, and the elderly and the sick. And it exacerbates uh, malnutrition uh, among the population. Um, in Senegal, we have a host of uh, challenges in terms of uh, food security and malnutrition. Uh, undernutrition remains a big challenge, um, which is caused by a lack of um, diverse diet and also adherence to proper food safety practices that are linked to WASH. And micronutrient malnutrition deficiencies are still a big problem, uh, vitamin A deficiency, iron deficiency, zinc deficiency. Uh, and to add to that, we still have poor complementary feeding practices due to lack of knowledge um, and lack of food among these communities. And uh, maternal nutrition is still um, also a problem. And this has um, a big problem, which is um, of generational linkages to malnutrition, whereby Mothers who are, are stunted will also give birth to children who have uh, nutrition challenges and growth challenges as they grow up. And this uh, perpetuates the, the vicious cycle of malnutrition and undernutrition. And as the uh, community in, um, in Senegal keeps growing, we are seeing the rise of urbanization and the increased uh, westernization of diets and this has contributed to uh, the double burden of malnutrition where uh, undernutrition and overnutrition coexist. Uh, we have people uh, having micronutrient malnutrition and at the same time they've got um, issues of obesity and diabetes and the like. Um, next slide, please. Um, and previously, there wasn't a lot of attention on food safety globally. And where there was attention by governments, especially in Africa, as Torek mentioned, it was mostly export oriented uh, to meet food safety standards for the commodities that were headed to Europe or to the US or other countries in the Middle East. Um, so most of the businesses that had proper food safety practices in Senegal were mostly uh, businesses that were exporting overseas. And there were strong enforcements for this because of the incentives that were linked to foreign currency. Um, and over the years, as food safety became uh, a big concern, there was more attention given to aflatoxins. And these are the chemical contaminants in foods. and 
This was because uh, cereals, uh, they are significant uh, staple foods in many countries and they impact food security and economies of many countries. And there was a big emphasis on addressing aflatoxin uh, food safety issues. But now research has shown that the biological hazards are more important because they are strongly linked to foodborne illnesses. Um, and um, studies by the WHO and partners have shown that uh, close to 600 million people uh, fall ill after eating contaminated foods. And this can result in unwarranted deaths, hospitalizations, which result in loss of life, loss of income opportunities, and uh, impacts on, on nutrition and the well-being of the society. Uh, and many nutrition programs globally have been promoting the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables and foods of animal origin because these are nutrient dense. But the conundrum is that these also happen to be the foods that are highly contaminated in terms of our biological hazards. And in FES, in this program, we are particularly focusing on these foods that are nutrient dense, uh, the highly perishable fruits and vegetables and foods of animal origin. So this project hopes to address food safety issues along the food supply chain, especially by, by the players in the business of supplying food and ensuring that good standards are met and people are eating safe and nutritious foods. Next slide, please. So in this work, it is important that we put uh, the food system lens in examining the role of the growing food businesses and food safety um, in Senegal. Um, as some of you know, uh, a food system is a full set of processes, activities, infrastructure, environment, that encompass the production, processing, distribution, waste disposal, and food consumption. This is as defined by our colleagues in the Agriculture for Nutrition program within the CGIR system uh, with a flagship on food systems for healthier diets. Our work in FES is going to be particularly uh, focused on food safety issues along the food system uh, supply chains or the food supply chains and looking at how food is moving from the production sites all the way to the consumers. But we also want to understand also the consumer behavior because in many countries like Senegal, the consumers are not usually empowered or unaware of their role in demanding safe and nutritious foods and causing businesses to adjust their practices so that their needs are met. So we would want to understand also how consumer behaviors can affect the behaviors of the growing food businesses working along the food supply chain. But we also not uh, neglect other aspects like the food environment, because they play an important role in the diets, but more importantly, the nutritional impact of our work in improving the nutritional outcomes we desire and the economic growth opportunities associated with proper food safety practices and adequate nutrition. Next slide, please. So as you look at uh, the food systems work, you look at the country like Senegal uh, where most of the people are still um, living in the rural areas. They are still subsistence farmers and they constitute what is called the traditional food system where people are consuming minimally processed foods that is available seasonally and collected for home consumption uh, with occasional sourcing of food from informal markets. And the challenge here is that people do not have good access to the highly nutritious fruits and vegetables and animal source foods. But if, if you move into the large cities and secondary urban areas, you, in, you encounter what is called the mixed food system, where food producers rely on both formal and informal markets to sell their crops. And you can encounter highly processed foods, packaged foods, 
that is more accessible uh, to people physically and economically. Um, but in some cases, this food tends to be expensive for many of the people who we can call base of the pyramid consumers. And while food standards are there in existence at national level, there may not be adequate enforcement or implementation by the local authorities, whether at, at national level or at um, uh, city level, municipality level, uh, or community level. So our work is going to focus mostly within this food mixed food system uh, approach where the growing food businesses are operating, mostly in the urban environment and secondary cities and towns. Next slide, please. So as has been defined, this is just a reminder to you that we are using the term growing food businesses to describe these small to medium scale size local food businesses that are influential actors in the food systems who have a desire to grow, but more importantly, to embrace food safety as an integral part of their business strategy so that we can achieve the change we want. As some of you know, uh, growing food businesses in many countries, especially in Senegal, are the major suppliers of food close to 70% of the food that people eat in the cities, in secondary cities and towns. So addressing their food safety issues will ensure that the majority of the people are getting access to safe, nutritious uh, food for their, for their families. Uh, next slide, please. So as we heard from Thorik, the, the first presenter, there are some challenges to achieving uh, food safety among uh, the growing food businesses. Um, we know that the growing food businesses are, are important in the production, processing, and retailing of our highly nutritious fruits and vegetables and animal source foods. And most importantly, the, the cereals and legumes that are the major staples. And the food systems in a country like Senegal are highly informal and most, in most cases unregulated. And this can present a challenge in terms of coordination and implementing uh, the system that we want to get safe and nutritious food available. And uh, the, the compliance with the national food regulation requirements um, can also be challenging, um, but this has been done very well for the export markets. But doing it with the informal sector for the domestic consumers uh, is going to be a challenge um, as well. And um, now we are seeing another conundrum in that um, most of the food that is consumed in developing countries in Africa is now imported uh, abroad from Europe, from China. And some of the growing businesses uh, involved in importing this food from these countries and uh, addressing food safety challenges that are related to the importation of these foods uh, can also pose a significant challenge to the supply chain and for food systems. Um, but more importantly, the domestic-based uh, growing food businesses, like many countries in Africa, they face the challenge of implementing the full HACCP system and its prerequisite program because the HACCP system is expensive for some of them and it is way too complicated for them to understand and comprehend and implement it on a daily basis uh, to be compliant. So what can we do about these challenges, especially for HACCP, for the growing food businesses? Next slide, please. So we can look to other countries that have faced a similar challenge. Uh, in the UK, they have a, a, an innovative program called Safer Food, Better Business that was designed by the Food Standards Agency to help uh, restaurants, cafes, takeaway joints, and catering businesses to achieve the desired outcomes of a full hustle program without implementing the full HACCP program. 
So many of these um, food joints were owned by small businesses, um, immigrant population, and they were not able to address a full HACCP program because it's expensive. It takes time from their business and they didn't see the importance of it. So linking the adoption of food safety practices to good business was key, but more importantly, coming up with a system, a food safety management system that is simpler to implement was also going to be an incentive for these um, small businesses to implement and uh, achieve food safety for their businesses and becoming profitable. So this is a model that can uh, be adopted for low-income countries in Africa, especially in Senegal, with some adjustments, of course. Um, so this system should uh, help uh, these growing food businesses apply with food hygiene regulations, uh, make food safely, uh, training their staff, more importantly, protect their business reputation, and improving uh, food waste or reducing food waste, which is a problem among many growing food businesses in low-income countries like Senegal. Next slide, please. So one of the innovation that can also be adopted in, uh, in many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia are uh, the mobile uh, technologies, the ICT-based technologies, uh, my previous uh, speakers mentioned the MSEF tool that is being used um, in, in this program by FES in Senegal effectively. This is a way to connect with the growing food businesses and uh, with the younger uh, people who are more in tune with mobile technologies and can be a tool for monitoring food safety standards and also affecting uh, messaging and behavior change among food businesses. We can see that uh, the World Bank and its arm, the IFC in Kenya, partnering with Twiga Foods, have uh, developed such a tool to promote uh, food safety among the agricultural value chains in smallholder farmers in rural Kenya and in former markets in the retail sector in the cities. And I think this program is working well so we may want to, to learn from these uh, programs and scale them up in a country like Senegal and other target countries where FES will be implementing this project uh, like Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Nepal. Next slide, please. Um, one of the challenges that we also can understand and try to address is the effect of training on food safety and food uh, handlers um, in, in Senegal and um, like um, countries where food safety systems are not in place. Uh, we know that many of the growing food businesses have food handlers and many of these may have very low levels of education and understanding of the importance of hygiene and food safety. So uh, proper training is important, and we have done some work where I used to work at the International Potato Center, where we saw that frequent food safety training improves knowledge and hygiene practices among food handlers. So we need to have a way in which these growing food businesses are exposed to repeated messages and frequent training the right content on improving the knowledge of the people who are handling food and dealing with food so that we have good uh, practices implemented and food and safe food going to the communities and consumers out there. And food safety training can also be used for monitoring and enhancing uh, the quality of the food that is processed by the growing food businesses. So the key message here is that behavior change among food handlers is important and knowledge will be a key driver of this behavior change and repeated messaging is also important because it's part of um, adult education. Uh, many people 
have challenged retaining knowledge, so they need repeated messaging to retain the knowledge and implement it. Uh, next slide, please. What we also need to take care of are uh, the issues of gender and, and youth empowerment among the growing food businesses in, in Senegal. And my colleague Mariama mentioned the work they're doing with the youth, uh, but this work also incorporates a significant portion on gender. We are developing tools that are gender sensitive, and we hope our work will be gender transformative not just addressing issues related to women, but addressing issues related to both men and women who are the major drivers of the, of the growing food businesses. So we want to understand whether there are significant differences between uh, growing food businesses run by women in terms of their food safety practices and if there are any gaps so we can address them effectively. And we want the youth to be included as well because they are the growing entrepreneurs in the food sector and they run most of the street-based uh, food businesses. And we want to ensure that they are trained and they have access to resources to make sure that their growing food businesses in Senegal are food safety compliant and they are profitable and they are sustainable and they are contributing to the overall well-being of Senegalese uh, by providing safe and nutritious foods. Next slide, please. So at this point, I would like to end my, my talk and uh, I'll be joining you uh, for, for, for additional questions that you may have about the work being done by FES and in particular, the food system and nutrition lens that we are trying to address. Thank you for your time. There we go. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much to our three presenters for your very thorough um, presentations. And thank you to our attendees uh, for engaging in the chat box and for posting your questions. So we have up to 30 minutes now for audience Q&A. And so I think we should just go ahead and dive right in. All right. So um, let's see, a, a couple of questions came in for you, Mariama, and I thought we could jump into those first. Uh, one question was from Jackie Nyonjo, who asked, how did you go about identifying the ambassador firms? Yes, thank you, Julie. So uh, in identifying them, as I said, we've uh, released a uh, request for questions of interest, and many of them just responded. And since we had said before some uh, election criteria, and based on that, we, uh, we could select them. But they are not, uh, a, they're not, they're just few in Senegal. Our ambassador firms will be um, uh, mostly those big distribution uh, firms that are well established, and they, in themselves, they don't have food safety problems. I mean, food safety, they have food safety policies and they are compliant. But since we target the whole value chain, in their value chains, we have some GFBs that are smaller and that face challenges in food safety. So uh, yes, the, uh, we could identify them through the expression of interest and also by digging more into that selection process, we could see uh, who was most committed to work with the program. I'll just stop there, Julie. Great, thank you. And I'll ask one more question to you at the moment from Damodar Kanel, who asked, what was the role of local and national governments in the five-step process that you outlined from discover, design, disseminate, et cetera? Uh -huh. uh, thanks for this uh, question. As I said, it's about uh, co-designing, and we could not do it by ourselves. It, there is a co-component, 
that's because we are different stakeholders to do so. And government agencies are integral part of the school design. We have our ministries of commerce, the different ministries uh, in perishable foods like agriculture, uh, the Ministry of uh, Livestock, and all those ministries uh, involved in charge of perishable foods, uh, also commerce, as I said, etc. So that they are integral part in this program and working in close collaboration with us. Great, thank you. We had a question come in from Ghislaine Moyangata about food safety indicators. Are there any examples of food safety indicators that Business Drivers has identified? And I thought perhaps we could expand that a bit more to um, you know, an answer about what is the state of food safety indicators right now? And Thorik, perhaps you could weigh in on that one. Sure, <clears throat> happy to do so. And uh, also uh, would welcome uh, insights from uh, Tawanda, my colleague, who's given us a lot of thought uh, through his uh, background research and literature review. Uh, but yes, we have uh, sorted through uh, a lot of different uh, potential indicators. Um, and these indicators uh, we're looking at uh, need to serve sort of two purposes. You know, we are an implementing partner with USAID, and therefore we are beholding and demonstrate we have moved the needle there are these growing food businesses but they also need to make sense to businesses themselves uh, they cannot have indicators that we and then Sorry, Julia, I think I dropped off uh, a little bit. Am I back? Yeah, I, I was just double checking and I, I did miss about the, the last 30 seconds of what you said. All right, I no, I was, I was just saying on indicators, a uh, uh, critically important topic, something that we're spending a lot of time and energy on because this is new space for USAID uh, around food safety uh, programming. Uh, as Tawanda pointed out, it's a critical component of food security. And uh, we're coming to this with fresh eyes. And uh, we're attempting to, as part of our research and learning agenda in uh, BD for FS, we're attempting to identify which indicators, first of all, give us uh, the necessary information that we need to report out to USAID on progress and impact and change uh, within the food system and among the stakeholders that we're interested in, which are these uh, growing food businesses. But these indicators also need to serve the purpose uh, of helping the business, right, to modify their business practice. And it has to be an indicator that um, helps them improve their business practice, right? Uh, and so uh, some of the ones that we're looking at are uh, indicators around food loss because the assumption is that food loss um, affects the bottom line of a business and reducing food loss will motivate the, the business to adopt practices that will ensure that. And then the other key indicator that we are uh, measuring and defining and constructing is um, change, <clears throat> excuse me, change in the risk of food contamination. And uh, we're uh, exploring different modalities to do that as well. But um, the idea would be that a business would be motivated to uh, adopt this indicator because again, it would contribute to their bottom line, right? That they would reduce the risk the reputational risk, but they would also be able to access markets that are demanding safer food. So those are the two indicators we're working on. Happy to share uh, in written form uh, some of our learnings around this, but it is a steep learning curve. 
Uh, we're attempting to uh, chart new territory here. Great, thank you. And um, I think you said that Tawanda might want to weigh in on this one as well. Tawanda, did you have anything to add, my friend? I thought I, I think you 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 answered it very well. Um, I think the important indicators are going to be uh, at the growing food businesses themselves, and um, understanding how to assess uh, the behavior change uh, based on the inputs that we are providing to to them in, in terms of knowledge, and uh, also measuring some of the post harvest losses that can be proxy to how they are implementing some of the learnings that we are sharing with them. So I think you did great. Um, we can provide more resources in writing to those who would want to learn more about this indicator development process. Yeah, it's a, it's a very important discussion. Uh, Tawanda, while I have you, allow me to ask you a couple of questions. One came in from Jean-Michel Voisdarjust, who asked, I see you are partnering with supermarket chain Auchan. Do you have a strategy to approach the large, less equipped traditional food sector? Uh, thank you, Julie. And I think there's another question related to that uh, from Manju, who's asking about a HACCP system um, for, for growing food businesses. So that's, 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 that's going to be linked so that I can address both questions together. Um, I, I think when I mentioned the, the challenges of implementing a full HACCP, this is a real issue among small businesses in low-income countries. The cost of implementing a full HACCP is, is a lot in terms of money and in terms of time. So many of them may not be ready to implement a full HACCP program and that has consequences on food safety coming from their operations. So what we are doing at the moment is learning from other countries, from other sectors, on how best we can come up with a program that a food safety management system that meets the, the targets that we hope these growing businesses should achieve. So I mentioned the, the safer food, better business model, from the UK that was developed for restaurants and cafes. Um, it was a way in which small businesses can be trained uh, and use a simplified system that is, that is less expensive and doesn't have complicated reporting requirements that does not require somebody with a degree or advanced education to understand. So even somebody with a lower level of training can understand. So we are looking for these simplified tools that uh, growing food businesses in Senegal can implement. But at the same time, the programs should deliver what we want them to achieve in terms of food safety. So it's, it's a learning journey that we are embarking on. Um, and as time goes by, we'll be able to share some of our findings if we happen to implement a desired simplified version of addressing food safety for the growing food businesses. So we're in a learning phase and we'll be um, willing to share what will come out of that work in the near future. I think the question on the supermarkets, uh, Mariama can um, address can address it uh, better than myself. Yeah. And Thorak, I know you wanted to jump in here as well. Thank you, Tawanda. Sure, I think uh, Tawanda summarized it uh, most uh, most adequately. But I just wanted to add, we are uh, endeavoring with businesses, with uh, government, with different stakeholders, right? up with appropriate and feasible uh, food safety standards that these growing businesses can achieve and can incorporate and from which they see uh, demonstrable benefits you know to to adopting them so rather as Twanda said rather than a full HACCP you know is there a bronze standard 
of food safety practices that we can uh, develop, co-develop with the different uh, different stakeholders in the food system, including including the government and the regulatory bodies. But that would uh, also um, uh, benefit businesses directly, right? So it is a uh, curve that as businesses move along and as they grow, they also can uh, improve the, the standards uh, that they're using for their own food uh, handling practices. One of the things we're looking at is, in addition to everything else, is a uh, is an, an app, the simple app that doesn't require reading or writing skills that businesses could use to uh, develop their food safety management system or their food safety management plan. And they're upon uh, actions, essential food safety practices that they have agreed to when they start their journey with us in BD for FS. So it does incorporate um, the science that we know from food safety because food safety is a very developed field. Uh, and how do we migrate the key elements of food safety science into this community, a uh, business community that has uh, different vary, uh, varying degrees of capacity and financing and existing technologies. So this is all new split face, a space that we're exploring and we welcome ideas and suggestions and contributions and as well as uh, partnerships to move this forward. But our overall goal uh, of engaging with the business community is, um, is to, as one of the actors, one of the key five actors within the culture of food safety is to increase their role and increase their interaction with the other actors so that we can uh, in, uh, enhance the culture of food safety at a national level. Great, thank you so much to both of you. Mariana, you were jumping in for a moment there. I, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything. Just wanted to respond to the question about our traditional uh, supermarkets here. So, uh, of course, they are being considered as partners. But uh, as I said, we have a championship uh, approach and uh, we won't be just be able to work with everybody at the same time. So it's a progressive approach. And yeah, just wanted to reassure that our traditional uh, large firm are uh, also consider. And if I may quick jump in here, Julie, there's a question from uh, Sheikh Nyai about what were our selection criteria. Uh, to be part of our GFB's participant. So uh, we've set, as I said, some selection uh, uh, criteria within the, the team here, and I can just cite a few uh, that can be related to, our, to the business structure of the business. Um, we have to verify if it's a more or less uh, formal or formalized business if there is a minimum of production, if uh, we look also in the market side of this, are the products of these GFBs oriented to the export market or the local market? Because uh, the aim is not uh, a uh, opposition uh, between exports and imports, but I think it is important to this bd for fs program to um, do everything that it can in partnership with different stakeholders so that we have safe and nutritious products in the local market. So that was counting also in the criteria, uh, selection criteria. And we also looked uh, into the reputation of the of the enterprise we Senegalese, so we know what's going on on the ground. So based on if the JFB has a good reputation or not, 
that would also count in the selection criteria. And I'll stop there now, Julie. Thank you so much, that's very helpful. I'd like to take it back to a question that came in a bit earlier from Patrick Coomson, who asked, are consumers able to differentiate food produce that are safety compliant on the market? And if yes, does it come at a marginal price increase to the consumer relative to those that are not hygienic? And um, I know, Thorpe, that you might be interested in commenting on some of the work to understand consumer awareness of food safety, and others are welcome to jump in as well. Yes, I can speak to it a little bit and uh, also would invite my colleagues to give more specific information. But, Patrick, yes, you've hit the nail on the head. This is the crux of the issue. I mean, the real drivers in the food system are, is consumer behavior and consumer willingness to pay for uh, safer food products. And, of course, the challenge is how do consumers know what is safer and what's not? Because when you go to the – even in a supermarket or uh, processed foods and certainly in traditional markets uh, – you could have safer food next to less safe food, and how would you know as a consumer, right? And if you're a price-sensitive consumer, which uh, the majority of the constituent populations that we're concerned about are certainly price-sensitive consumers, right? Uh, Wanda talked about food safety's contribution to food security, and the food insecure populations in many countries are spending up to 80% of their income, total income, on food purchases. And so to ask them to pay an additional price for a food product that is marketed as safer but yet looks the same as one that's uh, not safer, uh, and when there's no real guarantee, right, when there's no real certification uh, process, this is indeed the challenge and that we're endeavoring to sort through and mapping that out. Uh, starting with uh, understanding consumers' perception of food safety. So we indeed have uh, initiated that in Senegal uh, through some consumer surveys. We did it around the polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, and most people, most consumers were totally unaware. This, uh, this uh, smoked fish in Senegal, as in most of West Africa, is a key ingredient, key seasoning ingredient, uh, for a vast majority of vulnerable populations uh, and the levels of consumptions uh, given the uh, levels of contamination could be worrisome, right? Uh, but yeah, what we found during the survey was that most people were not aware of it, had never heard of it. Uh, so the issue around consumer education, raising consumer awareness, we have a whole component there. We have a colleague uh, a team in Senegal that is focused on um, increasing public discourse around food safety in Senegal. Uh, and so working with the media, the media is one of the key five actors in the culture of food safety, along with educational institutions, along with the government, along with consumers. So uh, we're also engaged with consumer groups in uh, Senegal as well to disseminate information to them, for them to then pass through out through their networks. So it is a long road. It is a um, interactive process uh, among businesses uh, as well as uh, among consumers. But the theory is that if, um, if there is an increased awareness, there also can be a concomitant uh, increased demand for safer food. And in most cases, it will be the uh, growing middle class in Africa that will drive the demand for safer as well as more nutritious foods. So how do we link to that? How do we connect with that? And then once uh, the supplier responds to that increased demand, how do we make it affordable and available to the more vulnerable populations? So those that are spending 80% of their income on food, how do we change the supply and access and availability so that they can also change their purchasing and consumption patterns? But I uh, would uh, look to Twanda and uh, Mariama for additional comments on this. Uh, it's the critical issue. It is the driver for food safety.
Yes, Tariq, um, I agree. It's a challenge for consumers to differentiate um, safer food from unsafe food because some of these things are not clearly visible. Um, but what's important to understand is this is a multi-stakeholder initiative. It's not work that can be done by this program alone. It's not work that can be done by one government department or ministry. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a process that should be done at na national level with all the key stakeholders engaged. So from our previous speaker, we heard that wash practices and the growing food businesses were found to be deficient. Uh, in as much as wash is important at household level, of which many resources have been put towards wash at household level to improve hygienic practices for preparing food for children. Many of the growing food businesses in Africa, they lack uh, proper abolition facilities, hand washing facilities, even access to clean water. So when they, their produce or when their products go to market, um, the way in which their food was handled may not be uh, desired and there's no way for consumers to differentiate. So it's going to be important to, to, to the programs to train uh, the growing food business food handlers in, in uh, hygienic practices and also to build their capacities so that they have access to clean water and the facilities they need for their food handlers to uh, be hygienic and practice these hygienic practices. So it's, 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 a, it's a tough issue. Uh, some countries have tried uh, the certification program that Thorik mentioned. They may work to some extent, they may not work to some extent. But what's exciting me, what's coming up now, is the role of the, of the consumers uh, through crowdsourcing, the use of mobile technologies in which consumers can share information about certain uh, facilities not meeting standards and people avoiding buying food from certain vendors, from certain markets. Uh, so I think that's going to be important as part of the strategy to disseminate information to consumers. So if, if consumers are empowered with information about where food is safer and who's producing food, I think that's gonna incentivize the growing food businesses to be compliant to consumer expectations so that they may not get the bad label and miss on the business opportunity. So we, I think we should uh, take a, a, a good look at these uh, crowdsourcing tools that are really amazing. Uh, many of the consumers in, in Africa have a smartphone or a cell phone where they receive text messages, where they are on WhatsApp groups. Information is being shared a lot of times on the internet. Uh, so we can capitalize on those tools to educate the consumers. That may incentivize businesses, especially growing businesses to be compliant. That's just one example that, that I think can work. Yeah, that, that makes sense and it's very interesting. Thank you, Tawanda. We have time for one or two more questions, so I'm hoping to squeeze in a couple more before we end here. And so I'd ask our, um, our presenters to be fairly brief in your answers to these very meaty and important questions. Um, Wanda, there was a question that might go to you, which was from Kristen McNaughton. How do you think about or manage trade-offs between food safety and food loss and waste? in both training for vendors and information for consumers? Or is there a trade-off? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, in my opinion, um, food safety helps uh, growing food businesses reduce uh, food losses or food waste in their facilities. So many of the our uh, spoilage organi organisms can be managed by implementation of proper uh, food safety practices. But it's not an easy task. Sometimes um, it requires uh, huge capital investments for some of these growing food businesses to manage their food waste. Uh, this 
includes investments in cold chain facilities, uh, especially for the highly perishable fruits and vegetables, as they are moving from the producers all the way to the markets where consumers are, and also among the dairy sector and the fish sector. So it's, 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 it's an important question that uh, has a component of behavior change in it, and that is a component of, um, of financing and resourcing growing food businesses so that they have the infrastructure and the facilities to, to manage the food losses and at the same time improving on their food safety practices. I think there was a question from John about um, the role of financing uh, in, in the food safety arena. Um, I think it's an important question and I think it's an important area that many of the funders in the room should uh, incorporate as they look at supporting growing food businesses that are involved in these important value chains in Sub-Saharan Africa to have impact. Because one of the challenges that SMEs and growing food businesses have to properly manage their businesses is access to capital. We know that that's one of the biggest challenges for many of the businesses. If that remains a challenge, I think it's, go it's going to be a big challenge and obstacle for them to even consider incorporating food businesses in their businesses if they don't have the, the financial resources to, to stay afloat. Great, thank you so much. And we have time for one final question. Uh, let's see. All right, our, our final question that we'll squeeze in before we wrap up here was from Dan Norrell uh, for Thoric. What is the sustainability and exit strategy for training food handlers in informal markets beyond the life of the project funding? Yes, great question. Uh, <clears throat> the question applies to all uh, international development work. You know, what is the sustainability exit strategy? And uh, perhaps I could rephrase the terminology to transition uh, strategy. You know, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we found in the FSSA that there is strong food safety capacity in Senegal. And this is true in many countries that have an export agriculture sector, right? So, and this means uh, testing capacity, this means uh, cooling capacity, this means human resource capacity. So uh, the challenge is how do we migrate that? How do we move that into the national food sector? So part of our strategy is, you know, how do we stimulate young people, youth agripreneurs, to think about uh, providing services, especially around food safety, to growing food businesses so that FES um, is not in there forever, but there will be Senegalese businesses that will step in and say, hey, this is a place where I can make money as a youth, right? Uh, there's there's a space for digital technology. There's space for cleaning services, you know, that I can offer a business that you don't have to have it in-house. I can come in periodically and do a deep clean of your business so that you're compliant. And so these are our thinking is that the sustainability strategy will be embedded in the private sector, right? Uh, of course, with all the interface with the other actors in the, in the food system, especially in the culture of food safety, but really our set of actors that we're trying to stimulate to think creatively around this are in the private sector. So uh, we're looking to uh, youth entrepreneurs because as Mariama said, there are a good 50% of the population demographic. And so how do we get them excited? How do we get them to use that creativity, especially that digital creativity and apply it to the area of food safety? And this syncs to what is happening in the developed world, especially in the United States and Europe, that's moving to digital food safety systems. Anyway, I'll end there. It's a topic we could continue to discuss about and happy to follow up in other formats, but thanks again. And Thanks if so I much, may, Mar oh yes, Mariana, I was pass it to you. Very, thank you. Very quickly, uh, talk is absolutely right, and that's why we uh, that co 
aspect is very important for FAS. By doing it, we also uh, care about the sustainability of the project. That's why we want to co-design with entrepreneurs in Senegal, young people, um, also uh, uh, raising awareness uh, 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 of consumers so that even if the project is over, that was they were part of the the whole bd for fs spirit and they can keep on doing even without us that's all that i wanted to add Julie. thank you wonderful thank you so much all right we have come to the close of our webinar thank you all for sticking with us and to our participants thank you for joining and for your excellent questions uh, and engagement in the chat box and thanks to our presenters for uh, answering the questions uh, with a lot of agility and honesty, greatly appreciated. So we hope to continue the conversation going forward. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks to everyone. Take care. Bye.